Thank you. We would like to welcome everyone for joining us today. We will go through a webinar entitled 22Q, What Can You Do? We're very excited to be able to present this webinar to you today. During the course of the webinar, there will be several polling questions. You will select the Q&A button below the presentation to ask your own questions that our presenters will be happy to answer at the end of the call. During the polling questions, a pop-up will come up for you to answer the question to see how you stack up against the rest of the audience. Today we are happy to be able to present this webinar on 22Q, which we feel is very important. Our first presenter will be Donna McDonald McGinn, Associate Director, Clinical Genetic Center, Director 22Q and U Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Clinical Professor of Pediatrics, Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Our second presenter today from Natura will be Dr. Susan Gross, Professor of Clinical Obstetrics and Gynecology in Women's Health, Pediatrics and Genetics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and Chief Medical Officer at Natura. In order to start the webinar today, we will begin with a polling question. The question is, increasing maternal age increases the risk of microdeletions, including 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. True or false? Please answer and click Submit. The answer to the polling question is about 87% of participants said false which is the correct answer. Our second polling question to begin the webinar, most babies born with 22Q and 1.2 deletion syndrome are born to couples who have a family history of this disorder, true or false? Click submit when you're ready. Ninety percent of those polled said false which is correct. Okay, we are ready to begin our webinar today. We are very excited to start with Donna McDonald McGinn, who will talk to you about 22Q. What's it to you? Donna? Well, good day to everybody and uh, welcome to this webinar. I'm extremely excited to be speaking with you about 22Q, What's It to You? Uh, the image on the screen is Philadelphia in spring. Sadly, today um, we have torrential downpours, but everybody should think pink, happy flowers, um, and we're going to really enjoy the presentation today. Um, I have one disclosure, and that is that I have presented at a medical conference for Natera, um, and obviously I'm doing this webinar today. And as I said, I'm very happy to, sp to speak with all of you about 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome because, um, as you'll see throughout the presentation, it's an, a very important condition to be aware of, especially in the prenatal setting. So in order to... Um, give a firm overview. Um, I'll present a little bit of historical background, uh, talk about prevalence and associated features, and then uh, sort of scattered throughout some illustrative cases and then a group of them at the end just to hammer home the variability of the condition. And most of what I'll be presenting today is data based on more than a thousand patients evaluated at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So historically, in 1965, Angelo DeGeorge, pictured here, first described the association of neonatal hypoparathyroidism, leading to hypocalcemia, and immunodeficiency. And then later, congenital heart disease was added, um, and this condition came to bear his name. Now, multiple etiologies have been identified over time for DeGeorge syndrome, including teratogens such as maternal alcohol use, maternal diabetes, and maternal retinoic acid exposure. And in addition, a, no a number of chromosome abnormalities were also felt to be causative of DeGeorge syndrome, including 10P deletion, 4Q deletion, and then the most common, which is the 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, which we'll be uh, concentrating on today. <coughs> 
Now, all of these uh, conditions affect neural crest cell migration, in particular the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches, causing structural abnormalities, including the outflow track of the heart, leading to conotruncal cardiac anomalies, thymic hypoplasia, leading to immunodeficiency, and then hypoplasia of the parathyroid glands, leading to hypocalcemia. Now, in 1982, so a, a a bit later than when Dr. DeGeorge first described his constellation of findings, Elaine Zakai here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia identified this child with features of DeGeorge syndrome. So she had the typical triad of hypocalcemia, immunodeficiency, and congenital heart disease, in particular truncus arteriosus, but she also had a cleft palate and a jejunal web. So Dr. Zakai said, well, this seems like DeGeorge syndrome, but perhaps something else is going on. Laboratory studies revealed only 45 chromosomes, including a 1022 unbalanced translocation, resulting in deletions on both chromosomes 10 and 22. Thereafter, additional patients came to attention with unbalanced translocations involving 22Q11.2 and not chromosome 10, suggesting that DeGeorge syndrome may be due to a 22Q11.2 deletion. So from 1982 to 1992, visible cytogenetic deletions were observed in about 25% of patients, but the puzzle remained, what about the remaining 75% of patients? This led to the development of fish probes in the early 1990s, which identified submicroscopic deletions in the majority of patients with DeGeorge syndrome. And this was work done primarily in the UK with Pete Scambler's group and here in Philadelphia with Bev Emanuel and Debbie Driscoll at CHOP. Thereafter, clinical overlap in 22Q11.2 deletions were identified in patients with velocardiofacial syndrome, and these children were characterized by having palatal abnormalities, or the velo, cardiac anomalies, cardio, and mild facial dysmorphic features, the facial part of VCFS. In addition, patients in Japan had been described with conotruncal anomaly face syndrome with cardiac anomalies, particularly conotruncal anomalies, and dysmorphic facial features. And in those days, if you can believe it, uh, we didn't have email, so we faxed the Japanese and said, perhaps your children actually have a 22Q11.2 deletion, and sure enough, they did. Likewise, a smaller set of patients were found to have the deletion, including with opich g BBB syndrome, which we described here, and then others uh, confirmed that. And these children had laryngotracheal esophageal abnormalities, hypertelorism, hypospadias in mouths, and cleft lip and palate. And cleft lip had not really been described in association with this previously. And then also by the, the Italians in patients with Kaler cardiofacial syndrome, which was characterized by asymmetric crying facies, as seen here, and congenital heart disease. So this really demonstrated that these seemingly separate conditions actually had the same etiology, which was understandable as each entity was originally described by clinicians concentrating on his or her own area of expertise, including endocrinology with DeGeorge syndrome, cardiology with CTAF, and speech pathology with velocardiofacial syndrome. Now, subsequently, the diagnosis has become collectively referred to by the cytogenetic abnormality, even though it's quite a mouthful to say it over and over again, but it's the 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, which is the single common denominator that all patients have in common, whether they have features of DeGeorge or VCFS, et cetera. Now, current detection methods still include FISH, but MLPA and microarrays are now preferred for a few reasons, one of it, which is that they size the deletion, um, and I'll talk about that a bit more. Um, and then, in addition, microarrays really don't need any increased index of suspicion. So a person can see a child with multiple anomalies or developmental disabilities and send an array without saying, oh, you know what, those features really fit 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. 
And it's also important to recognize that 22Q1.2 deletion syndrome is a contiguous gene deletion syndrome. It involves haploinsufficiency of about 30 to 40 genes, and some would even say as many as 60, but it results in a multi-system disorder, and it's not an autosomal dominant condition where one gene, you know, one product um, with that 50% recurrence risk. It's really many, many genes, which, which matters. So it's also important to know that it's the most common microdeletion syndrome with an estimated prevalence of about 1 in 2,000 to 4,000 live births. But the actual occurrence may be higher in light of the variable expressivity. And based on data from a recent multicenter study using prenatal SNP arrays with Ron Wapner and his group, um, that found a much higher prevalence, which there was a little bit of bias of ascertainment in, the, in those uh, pregnancies that were screened, but still the numbers were quite high. And for sure, this is something we can better define via newborn screening as neonates are being identified incidentally via screening for a severe combined immune deficiency and there is a push um, to have newborn screening for 22Q11.2 DS and also via non-invasive prenatal testing. We've never had you know, a newborn screening like we did in the, in the 70s where we looked at consecutive births and looked at chromosomes, um, but this is an opportunity to really come up with true uh, prevalence figures. It's also important to know that uh, 22Q11.2 deletion is the second most common cause of congenital heart disease after Down syndrome. And it's identified in 52% of patients with interrupted aortic arch type B, 35% with truncus arteriosus, and 16% with tetralogy of Fallot. This is work that was done by Betsy Goldmunts here at CHOP, but very important to recognize if a baby's born with interrupted aortic arch type B, with or without any other findings, you know, the deletion is warranted. It's also important to recognize that you're more likely to find a child with a deletion who has tetralogy of Fallot than to find a child with Down syndrome. Much more common to have tetralogy of Fallot with 22Q than with Downs. It's also important to recognize that the 22Q11.2 deletion is the most common cause of syndromic palatal anomalies, including overt cleft palate, so something that you could see perhaps prenatally on ultrasound, cleft lip and palate, although less common, but the most frequent uh, palatal abnormality are submucosal cleft palate, bifid uvula, or velopharyngeal dysfunction, and I'll show you that in a second, which are not things that you would see prenatally. It's also the second most common cause of major developmental disabilities after Down syndrome, accounting for about 2.4% of individuals with such delays. So really an important diagnosis in the developmental disability community. Now, the overall prevalence of significant medical problems varies by age and at ascertainment, but there are some what I like to call heavy hitters. You know, there are parents who come in with a list of 180 findings associated with the deletion, and things like allergic shiners really are not that important. So we like to talk about things that really matter, um, both medically and uh, long-term outcome perspective. So. If you look at children, which is our bias of ascertainment, about three quarters have immunodeficiency, congenital heart disease, and palatal abnormalities. Now, if you look at the adult world and Ann Bassett's population in Canada, certainly these numbers differ, again, because the ascertainment is different. Um, about half of our children have hypocalcemia and finds it more prevalent in adults. And then about a third have renal abnormalities and feeding and swallowing problems. And then many uh, children have hypothyroidism, but we really don't have a good denominator. And Anne finds about 20% are hypothyroid in the adult world. Now, if we look specifically at these, uh, these systems, 77% of patients have immunodeficiency regardless of age, including impaired T cell production leading to chronic infection, humoral defects leading to poor responses to vaccines and often having to be revaccinated over and over again, IgA deficiency, and then we're seeing more and more uh, individuals with autoimmune disease, which we think is immune mediated. And so, for example, we recently had an infant identified through newborn screening for SCID because the T-cell lymphopenia in 22Q and severe combined immune deficiency is essentially the same. Um, 
when they get to the immunologist, they don't exactly look the same and they're not in as much trouble, but they're being picked up through this mechanism. So this was a child who came to attention for a positive newborn screen for SCID. She was seen by the immunologist who sent an array suspecting 22Q. It was positive. It didn't come back until six weeks, which is fairly typical for our arrays. Um, and when we saw the child, in addition, um, he had an inguinal and umbilical hernia. Um, he had had a history of significant feeding difficulties with nasal regurgitation and reflux, but more importantly, we sent a calcium that day and it was 7.0. So we don't know how that calcium was fluctuating since the newborn period, and we don't know if there is any effect of that hypocalcemia on the developing brain. Now, as I said, three quarters of our patients have cardiac anomalies, um, and I mentioned the big three if you look at cardiac populations in general, but if you do the flip and you look at our patients, the most common heart defect is Tetralogy of Fallot, followed by a VSD. Now, you know, about one in 100 babies are born with a VSD, and so if we were to screen every single one of those babies, we'd be doing lots and lots of blood tests. So we're not suggesting that we do, but we think that it's important to note that it's quite common in this population. In addition, there are some anomalies that you wouldn't notice on echo. So for, for instance, here you can see the indentation of the esophagus, which is made by a vascular ring. And this is seen in about 6% of individuals with 22Q1, 1.2 deletion, and something that causes significant uh, breathing, feeding problems, and, and strider. The other thing, if you look at the small print, is that although atypical, we have seen unusual heart differences in our, in our patients, including hypoplastic left heart syndrome, AV canal, and heterotaxy. Now looking again at the palate, 75% have palatal abnormalities in the pediatric population, but most don't have something that you see overtly. So only 11% have an overt cleft palate, and only 1% to 2% have a cleft lip and palate. So the rest have something that you won't see prenatally and won't even see in the newborn period when you're looking at the child's palate. Um, to understand VPI, it's important to look at these images. So on the left, at rest, you see the normal velopharyngeal port if you were to take a nasendoscope through the nares and come down behind uh, the, the uvula. So you're looking at that little bump on the left, and that is the musculus uvulae, which if you follow it down, becomes the uvula. And during crying and swallowing, you see a night tight tight closure of that velopharyngeal port. So no fluids are escaping into the nose, no food is escaping into the nose, and the speech would not be hypernasal. But on the right, in the child with 22Q who has velopharyngeal incompetence or dysplasia, at rest you can see that the anatomy is completely different, and then during crying or swallowing, you see the bubbling up of secretions. So when the child goes to say certain sounds in the English language, the air escapes through the nose and the child is very hypernasal nasal, and this is often something that has to be repaired before school age so the child can be understood. Now, again, talking about endocrine abnormalities and mentioning that they're common, I talked about hypocalcemia. Um, this is something that's generally present in the newborn period but can often be transient. Um, however, recurrent hypocalcemia occurs during times of stress, so including adolescence, during an illness, perioperatively, and importantly, during pregnancy. Um, now, Ann Bassett's group in Canada recent looked at, recently looked at neonatal seizures, and they feel that they're likely um, mediated by neonatal hypocalcemia and may increase the risk for more severe intellectual deficits. So again, hearkening back to our newborn that was diagnosed, uh, pre that was picked up for the SCID newborn screening, um, who knows what that hypocalcemia, uh, what effect that hypocalcemia had on the developing brain, and it looks like the Ann Bassett data is suggesting that it does, in fact, have a significant effect and something we have to explore further. Now, in addition to hypocalcemia, um, we see other findings, but just to mention that there are, there are likely kids living in endocrine um, that are not being picked up. So we've identified school-age children who had chronic hypocalcemia. 
they've had developmental delay, they've had learning differences, but they're often non-dysmorphic, or at least non-dysmorphic to the person who hasn't seen 1,300 patients with 22Q. Um, so these are children that we went in and found because we were looking for them, but they likely could have gone undetected for some time, perhaps even until adulthood following the birth of a child with a 22Q deletion, which is clearly something that we've seen over and over again. So an example is this young man who at 13 was identified in child development. He had a history of neonatal hypocalcemia that resolved. Then he had a recurrence of hypocalcemia in adolescence, and he had a nonverbal learning disability. And the developmental pediatrician said, I really think he has the deletion. And we said, we really don't think he does. And sure enough, he had the deletion. And we were basing it on some of the facial features that are lacking in this individual. Um, and then we looked further at African-American patients and found that many of them were lacking the typical features, and we wrote a paper suggesting that African Americans and other non-Caucasians are less likely to come to attention because they lack the typical facial features. Now, in addition to hypocalcemia, thyroid dysfunction, as I mentioned, has also been reported, and it can be congenital or later onset. In addition, we've seen hyperthyroidism, and these may co-occur with other autoimmune conditions, and again, we think this is immune-mediated due to the pokey overall immune system. So we identified a 10-year-old in infancy with the deletion. She had interrupted aortic arch type B. Um, she also had hypoparathyroidism, uh, so it wasn't too hard to come up with the diagnosis. She also had bilateral hydronephrosis. But at 27 months, she had a generalized seizure, tachycardia, and an enlarged thyroid, leading to the diagnosis of Graves' disease. Unfortunately, she failed medical therapy and required a thyroidectomy, and during that procedure, she had vocal cord paralysis and ended up needing a tracheostomy. So the child went from being a typical infant with 22Q1.2 deletion to a two-and-a-half-year-old with a trach um, with a very complicated uh, story. Now, the last thing associated uh, from an endocrine perspective is short stature. Um, and Alex Habel over at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London and ourselves put all of our growth data together, and we came up with these growth charts. Um, most individuals with the 22 deletion end up with an average height, but we found less than 2%. Uh, uh, we found 15%, uh, excuse me, with a height less than the second percentile. Um, and we also found a fair number with IUGR. Uh, but importantly, about 4% have frank growth hormone deficiency and will benefit from growth hormone therapy. And then the GI and GU abnormalities are also common. And I would say that the GI abnormalities are the, are the most difficult problem for families because all mothers expect that they should be able to feed their children. But about a third of those uh, with a 22Q1.2 deletion really have significant uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. They have esophageal dysmotility. As you can see in these upper GI images, um, the barium is squirting up into the uh, oral pharynx, the nasopharynx excuse me, when you follow the barium down through the esophagus, in the middle image you can see it's moving nicely, but on the right it's squeezing inappropriately. Um, in addition, it causes significant constipation as it moves through the entire gut. Uh, occasionally we see intestinal malrotation and Hirschsprung's Hirschsprung's disease, and we've also seen in perforate anus. So we had a child that was diagnosed prenatally with congenital heart disease. The family felt confident that the heart could be fixed, and they were not too worried about other associated problems, and then the child was born with imperforate anus. So again, changing the course significantly of that child and the long-term prognosis um, in terms of difficulties in other area. Uh, from a GU perspective, about a third have renal abnormalities, including renal agenesis, um, and there have been reports out of Belgium of kids with Potter syndrome diagnosed prenatally. Um, dysplastic kidneys, a duplicated collecting system, hydronephrosis, uh, cryptorchidism and hypospadias in males, and we've had a few adult females with an absent uterus. <laughs> 
Now, sticking with things that are common, intellectual deficits and psychiatric illness are quite common. Um, and so in both adults and children, more than 95% of individuals will have intellectual deficits. And then looking at the pediatric versus adult population, uh, psychiatric illness is also common, but obviously much more common in adults. So in the PEDS group, we see ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, anxiety, OCD, and ODD. Um, and then in adults, depression, anxiety again, which is a big, big problem for both children and adults, OCD. And then in 25% of adults, frank schizophrenia. Now, specifically, young children have delays in achieving motor milestones with a mean age of walking of 18 months. They have delays in emergence of language with a mean age of speaking at 30 months. And we even have some non-speakers as old as five to seven years. And then we have a subset with autism or autistic spectrum disorder. And in our population, it was around 10 to 15 percent. There are studies reporting as high as 50 percent. And then in school-age children, uh, they generally attend mainstream school with academic or behavioral support. Um, but you can see that the full-scale IQ is quite variable. So we have a third in the low average to average range, a third in the borderline range, so a full-scale IQ of about 70, and then a third in the, in the intellectual deficit group. Now, that last group usually had a secondary insult, so a hypoxic ischemic event during a surgery or a brain malformation, such which is polymicrogyria. Um, but it's important to also know that about 65% of the overall population of children had what's called a nonverbal learning disability. So they had a greater than 10-point split between their verbal and performance IQ, which essentially renders the full-scale IQ misleading, and they generally do better than what that full-scale IQ um, intimates. But this certainly affects educational interventions as the schools aren't used to this type of learning disability, as it's only seen in 1% of the general population of individuals with learning disabilities. Now you wonder what else could be wrong with these patients, but essentially every other system. So less common but significant features include ENT issues, such as laryngeal web, esophageal atresia, or TE fistula, often leading to polyhydramnios, uh, sensory neural and conductive hearing loss, diaphragmatic hernia, again, something not typically associated, and then skeletal differences such as vertebral anomalies, scoliosis, club foot, polydactyly, and radial ray defects. Other findings are found in the CNS system, so unprovoked seizures unrelated to hypocalcemia in about 15% of individuals, polymicrogyria, which I mentioned, and myelomeningocele in a very small subset. I mentioned autoimmune disease previously, but it bears repeating because many children have JRA or ITP, and those are things that really matter, especially uh, when thinking about surgical interventions. And then occasionally we see oncologic associations, including hepatoblastoma, which is much common in the 20, much more common in the 22Q deletion than in the general population. Wilms tumor, re renal cell carcinoma, medullary thyroid carcinoma, leukemia, oral cancers, neuroblastoma, and we recently had a child uh, with labial melanoma, an 11-year-old African American child. Um, so these are important. We think again they're immune mediated, um, not common but important. And then other findings, umbilical and inguinal hernia, coanal atresia, so there's some overlap with CHARGE syndrome, and then some craniofacial differences, including craniosynostosis. Uh, we found children with unicoronal, bicoronal, sagittal, lambdoidal, and pansynostosis, and these are all children who've had twist in FGFR studies, which were normal, so we feel that it is related to the 22Q deletion. We've seen hemifacial microsomia or auricular abnormalities, including microtia, anosia, preauricular tags, and preauricular pits, and these are often big clues to the diagnosis. Eye findings, including microphthalmia, anophthalmia, ptosis, sclerocornea, as shown here, retinal coloboma, again overlapping with charge, hypertelorism, tortuous retinal vessels, which are really a clue to the diagnosis and not a problem. And then you can see in these two individuals hooded eyelids um, or upslanting palpebral fissures, which can help us in terms of a dysmorphic uh, perspective. 
And then we've occasionally seen severe micrognathia with glossoptosis, so Pierre Robin, um, and some of these, these children have required a trach, and others have had mandibular distraction as have these two children. And then nasal differences can also be a clue to the diagnosis with or without cleft lip. So a nasal dimple or crease, hemangioma, prominent nasal root, bulbous nasal tip, and hypoplastic alanasi. And then again, asymmetric crying facies is quite helpful. We found it in 14% of affected individuals, and so now our plastic surgeons are recommending the study in anyone with asymmetric crying facies. Now again, important background, both sexes, all races, and ethnic groups are affected, and mortality is low, unlike the early reports of DeGeorge syndrome. So only about 4% of patients have succumbed to complications associated with the deletion in our cohort. Most were related to complex congenital heart disease, and the median age at death was four months. Um, and I will say, though, that Ann Bassett has several reports talking about early death in adulthood, um, and that to date is unexplained. Now, most deletions are de novo. You all pretty much knew that from the, the pre-poll question. But when familial, it's often a surprise. And then, of course, there's the result in 50% recurrence risk. So although most are, are de novo or new, once the deletion is there, there's a 50-50 chance, just like with an autosomal dominant condition. And the presence and severity of features varies by age, and the focus changes. So as you can imagine, the intensity of the focus in the newborn period, and often even prenatally, is congenital heart disease. And then we move to feeding, um, and we move to the palate, and we move to the chronic infection. But as the kids near school age, we're thinking about the speech, and can the palate be repaired? And then once we overcome those issues, the focus really shifts to the learning differences and the psychiatric illness, as well as the recurrence risk as the children age into adulthood. And the indications for diagnostic testing also vary by age. So you can imagine the congenital anomalies are the reason that most children come to attention. But in adulthood, if they didn't have those findings or someone wasn't thinking about it, they come to attention due to behavioral problems, the psychiatric illness, or frequently with a previously affected child. And the diagnosis is often missed, and this is especially true in adolescents, adults, and non-Caucasians, because these are individuals who can often blend into the general population. And this is complicated by both inter- and intrafamilial variability, even between identical twins, and something we're trying to figure out. Now, many of you may know this already, but just to reiterate, the 22Q11.2 deletion most often just happens as a result of non-allelic homologous recombination. And this is due to the presence of low copy repeats represented here as A, B, C, and D. So these repeats flank the region, leading to aber aberrant interchromosomal exchanges, resulting in either a duplication or a deletion. Now, low copy repeats, also known as segmental duplications, define the breakpoint, and they're used to describe the size of the resultant deletion. So a typical deletion extends from A to D, and an atypical nested deletion is smaller. So for instance, A to B, B to D, C to D, et cetera. Approximately 85% of patients have the same size deletion extending from A to D. And fish probes are located between A and B, as well as an important gene known as TBX1, which is thought to be responsible for many associated features, such as congenital heart disease. But there are other important genes in this region as well, including Crackle and SNAP29, that are located between B and D. These are considered important, um, and even more important is the fact that the fish probes are located between A and B, and therefore, if a patient had previous studies by fish and they were negative, they could have one of these nested deletions, and they would require additional studies such as MLPA or a microarray. <laughs> 
Now, there are a few important genetic counseling considerations that I'm just going to run through. So one is somatic mosaicism. So we have one family where we have an affected child, and we always test both parents. And in this case, the father, who was perfectly normal, was a mosaic. So he had 12% of uh, his blood cells with the deletion the first time, and we repeated it, and we, we found, again, that he was a 13% uh, mosaic. Um, we have not yet looked at additional tissue, but this is always a consideration when, when counseling families. In addition, germline mosaicism has been reported in the literature, and we recently saw this family where the child came to attention with a psychotic break versus Hashimoto's encephalitis at age 16. Parents showed us the pictures of the brother who had velopharyngeal incompetence, ADHD, and a learning disability, and sure enough, he was deleted. Um, neither parent was found to have the deletion. There's always the possibility of non-paternity, although we'll rule that out in the research lab very shortly, um, but because other uh, couples have been reported in the same situation, and it's been associated with other conditions, it's always important to counsel families about this potential recurrence risk. And then we have familial occurrence by chance alone. So we have the young woman on the left who came to attention very typically. Both parent studies were normal, and then the family called to say that they thought the nephew was affected. Um, and sure enough, he was. And we proved in the lab that the, the deletion occurred in the egg cells of the unrelated mothers. So simply by chance alone, and I think, again, reiterating the fact that this is quite common. And then we have patients with dual diagnoses. So we have a child with the deletion and Down syndrome, the deletion and Marfan syndrome, the deletion and the CHD7 mutation associated with CHARGE syndrome. So these are all things that need to be considered when you're looking at a child with atypical features. And then lastly, we have children who have a deletion on one chromosome 22Q, and then they have a mutation in a gene on the other allele. So we have children with significant bleeding disorders, including thrombocytopenia and megakaryocytes, due to a mutation in a globin gene on the other 22, leading to something called bernard Souillé syndrome. And then most recently, we reported children with Sednik syndrome, who had a deletion on one and a mutation in SNAP29 on the other, leading to polymicrogyria, ichthyosis, keratoderma, and other findings, um, which had been reported previously as an autosomal recessive condition. And now I just want to touch on a few of those example patients because I think they're important. So patient one was diagnosed as a neonate with tetralogy of Fallot. At home, he had twitching and joke and jerking. A calcium of 4.7 led to the diagnosis of the 22Q deletion. Subsequently, he had recurrent infection, including myringotomy tube placement. He had significant T cell dysfunction, holding his live vir viral vaccines until he was seven. He had velopharyngeal incompetence, requiring repair. He's had enamel hypoplasia, leading to multiple dental procedures under general anesthesia. He had vertebral anomalies and scoliosis, so he had a growing rod placed, and he's already had general anesthesia uh, to work on that growing rod four times. He's had recurrent hypocalcemia and short stature, ITP, and at age 14, he has developmental delay, intellectual deficits, dyslexia, ADHD, and significant anxiety. So really, there's very little else that this child could have going on with him. Patient two presented as a newborn with complex cardiac disease. Um, he had hypocalcemic seizures and idiopathic thrombocytopenia. He had sepsis and necrotizing enterocolitis, and sadly, he expired at four months of age. Patient three had failure to thrive in the newborn period with mild dysmorphic features. Uh, Surprisingly, we considered the diagnosis and it was confirmed. He had severe reflux resulting in G2 placement. And at five years, he was noted to have an intestinal marrotation requiring repair. And it was a little bit of an oddball marrotation, which is why it went so long uh, undiagnosed. In addition, he has mild learning differences with an IQ in the normal range. He has ADHD and debilitating anxiety. Patient four had significant respiratory and swallowing issues at birth, resulting in a tracheostomy and G2 placement. She also had hypocalcemia, and a very astute geneticist thought of the 22Q deletion. In addition, she's had severe reflux and chronic otitis media, requiring IV antibiotics, which is quite unusual. She's also had mild delays in achieving motor milestones and delayed speech, but is otherwise doing quite well.
Patient 5 had a cleft palate uh, requiring repair early on. He had sensory neural hearing loss and laryngotracheal malaysia. He had sleep apnea requiring tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, a G2 placement for significant reflux, bilateral inguinal hernia repair, cryptorchidism repair, chronic infection requiring IV IG therapy, He's one who has polymicrogyria and congenital nystagmus, and at age five years, he's nonverbal and nonambulatory. Patient six came to attention following the birth of her child with complex congenital heart disease. She holds a master's degree in family therapy, and she had a history of scoliosis and learning disability requiring tutoring, but otherwise went undetected her entire life. And patient seven was pokey in the newborn period with failure to thrive, reflux, nasal regurgitation, and chronic infection. He had delayed develop miles, developmental milestones, particularly in speech, and he was evaluated by 27 specialists without a unifying diagnosis. And his two physician parents were relentless. And finally, at age five years, he was found to have the 22Q and 1.2 deletion. And even now, his parents said they're not sure that they would be able to diagnose another child with the same diagnosis at, as it can be so variable. And finally, patients 8, 9, 10 came to attention following prenatal diagnosis of congenital heart disease, some with additional associated anomalies, some with a previously undiagnosed parent. And so it's really difficult to prognosticate in utero. But most parents feel like they can deal with the associated birth defects, but they have concerns regarding risk for developmental delay and developing psychiatric illness. So this variability poses significant challenges. How do we approach individualized management, and how do we address the population as a whole? So the International 22Q and 1.2 Deletion Syndrome Consortium developed guidelines to address these things. And they're practical guidelines, and they include tables and really straightforward information as to what to do. And for anybody who'd like reprints, please feel free to email me at mcginn at email.chop.edu. But in brief, it highlights the emphasis, uh, it, the highlights emphasize the need for adequate monitoring and treatment of hypocalcemia and thyroid dysfunction. And then as needed, infant stimulation and specialized educational interventions, for instance, for autism, speech therapy and palatal evaluations, treating the psychiatric illness, treating everything that's treatable, and often standard treatment works, but sometimes specialist referrals are necessary. And then emphasizing that early diagnosis and effective treatment really does improve outcome, both from a physical and a cognitive perspective. We also listed pregnancy as a biologic stressor in women with 22Q. So they have a risk for new onset hypocalcemia. They have adult congenital heart disease related risks. They have risks related to treatment for underlying idiopathic seizure disorders the associated autoimmune disease, in particular platelet disorders, and problems associated with underlying psychiatric disease. And then we also emphasize that so social considerations are needed, such as genetic counseling, prenatal monitoring, and future preconception counseling. So in summary, 22Q, what is it to you? Well, 22Q is common, and you need to know that. Um, and there are typical features identifiable in prenatal imaging, some of which you already know by heart, such as congenital heart disease and overt cleft lip and palate, or Piero Ban. But the other things that you may not have considered include renal anomalies, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, TE fistula, IUGR, polydactyly, club foot, craniosynostosis, micrognathia, neural tube defects, and importantly, polyhydramnios. Um, and the variability really presents a huge challenge both pre- and postnatally. And early detection will definitely lead to improved long-term outcome. So if you loved this presentation and you'd like to learn more, feel free to consider attending the 9th Biennial International 22Q Conference, which will be held next month in Spain, or consider joining the newly formed 22Q Professional Society. We really, really need people who work in the prenatal world to be a part of this society.
And I would just like to thank all my colleagues at CHOP and around the globe, because certainly I couldn't present this webinar to you today without the help of all the people in all the disciplines here at CHOP and then my colleagues who have taught me so much elsewhere. And then I'd just like to thank the patients and families for everything that they've taught us, because as I'm sure you know, it always begins with a patient. So thank you for your kind attention, and I will switch gears um, over to some polling questions and then to Sue Gross. Thank you, Donna. That was fantastic. We are going to have one polling question. 22Q and 1.2 deletion is more common in cystic fibrosis and trisomy 18. True or false? Click Submit when you're ready. Ninety-three percent said true, which is in fact the correct response. Our next presentation will be by Dr. Susan Gross, and it will be about panorama at Natera and why we added microdeletions. So, uh, hello to everybody on the line. Uh, it is really a pleasure to uh, just share the few minutes we have left in the hour. And most importantly, to thank Donna, it's really a privilege and an honor uh, to share a webinar with someone who I and uh, our academic world certainly consider one of the leading experts uh, in the field. So I'm just going to quickly uh, take you through an overall picture of why we added the microdeletions we did, and certainly a little bit of a discussion regarding 22Q and the ability to now prenatally screen for this disorder. So again, our uh, technology uh, is unique, uh, and I'm just going to very briefly uh, describe why that is so and the features that give us the ability to detect 22Q uh, in a prenatal setting and provide a risk assessment. Uh, the uh, non-invasive prenatal uh, screening test uh, is, was previously and is still being done uh, using counting methodology. It's a quantitative approach, and very simply, we um, very simply you can look at pieces of DNA, DNA sequences from a chromosome of interest. For example, chromosome 21 in the case of Down syndrome, and then you measure the amount. And in the case of chromosome 21, if there's more compared to reference chromosome, you may be at higher risk for Down syndrome. Uh, Natera, and specifically Panorama test is different. It's a second generation approach and we call it the SNP methodology and again I will just briefly describe to you what that means. Instead of looking at a whole length of sequence or pieces, we actually look at the base pairs. And again here you see a T, uh, as you know there's really only four base pairs, T, A, G, and C. And when we talk about SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, here you see a sequence uh, publicly accessible from the database of a portion of our genome. Uh, the Human Genome Project basically categorized and put in sequence three billion of these letters. And just to explain what a SNP is, a single nucleotide polymorphism, um, at a location I may be a T, you may be a C. And most of the time when that happens, it's actually not a problem. It's a wonderful thing. It accounts for diversity that we see in the human species. Uh, and we used to think it occurred about one in a thousand times. Um, this is, again, from a public access website. I encourage all of you uh, to go online and learn more. But it likely occurs one in 300 times. Every 300 letters, there's a little change between us, most commonly between genes. And they have proven to be incredibly useful markers in science and clinical laboratory medicine, likewise with Panorama. So what we're able to do is take a look at those SNPs of interest on the chromosomes of interest. The Panorama test, uh, previously to the release of the microdeletion panel, looked at chromosome 13, 18, 21, X, and Y. But using the same very sensitive approach, we can look at a smaller piece of the chromosome. We can look at a submicroscopic level. So chromosome 21, Down syndrome, is when a whole 21 is uh, there in an extra copy. When we talk about deletions, and 
for example, 22Q deletion, we're looking at a small piece of the chromosome that is no longer there. A microdeletion in general, again, is not a single gene that's missing, but several genes um, in sequence. And the usual karyotype methodology we use can only visually detect 5 to 7 to 10 megabases, which, is, which are actually small pieces, but relatively large. Microdeletions are on a much smaller scale. And to answer the question uh, in terms of what is common, 22Q is actually more common than all the disorders that we currently screen for. Um, and in fact, depending on your age, microdeletions as a whole become very substantial. If you take a look at uh, this slide, aneuploidy, the blue line, is definitely related to age. And we know that, and we've known that forever, and certainly as you start to hit you know, 28, 30, uh, you can see that the line starts to curve up. The importance of microdeletions is it is age independent. I cannot overstress this. There is no high risk, low risk. It is a risk that can affect anybody. Donna pointed that out beautifully in her presentation. And please note what happens as you get younger. In fact, for a younger woman who is pregnant, microdeletions may be a more significant issue than even uh, the aneuploidies that we have been testing for now for decades. The microdeletions that we did elect to put on the panel were very, very carefully selected. First of all, they all have to be, um, they all have to be uh, a serious disorder in that there is significant morbidity uh, and or mortality associated with the disorder. There are some deletion syndromes um, that are less severe. Um, they are not on this panel. Uh, and 1P36, for example, 22Q uh, is well known to have prenatal cardiac uh, malformations. So that is definitely relevant to the obstetrical community. Uh, the disorders range in size. Uh, 22Q is the one that's actually the smallest. And um, the other issue about 22Q, and it is relevant for the other microdeletion syndromes as well. We're interested in the disorder. The patient is interested in the disorder. The patient doesn't know about sizes of microdeletions. It doesn't know about megabases or kilobases. They want to know if their child is at risk potentially for a particular disorder. Um, so to that end, uh, we do look at specific uh, deletions, and we provide sensitivities and specificities for particular deletion of a specific size, but we also, as you will see, take into account that a particular disorder it may not account for the entire reason that uh, as to cause of Prader Willi or to Angelman or 22Q. And a simple way of saying that is that there are two deletions, as you heard, um, to simplify Donna's talk that was uh, more specific. But there is a larger deletion that accounts for the majority of 22Q, but there is a smaller deletion uh, that is very important as well that currently we are still not able to detect, although we are working on uh, that now as well. So again, speaking to what I just mentioned, these are the sensitivities and specificities when we are looking at very specific particular deletions. Um, and as you can see, all well within uh, and well over 90%. Uh, but just to conclude, even when you look at such wonderful sensitivities and specificities, in the office, that's actually not the primary concern. We usually don't talk about sensitivities and specificities. This is all that matters. When a patient turns around and says, doctor, if I am at high risk, what does that mean for my baby? That's really the question that we have to answer. And the reason that we have to focus exactly like Donna said, on the patient and on the patient's concerns, is that sensitivities and specificities, that's what we use more in terms of lab validation and on the, um, on the laboratory side of a test. Sensitivity tells you about the condition. In other words, if we have 100 children with a particular condition, what is the sensitivity? How many times are we going to get that right? In fact, what our patients care about is positive predictive value, and that is about test outcome. In other words, out of all the women that we screen every day, if there is a positive screening test, what is the risk that the unborn child 
actually has the problem that we were looking for in the first place. Or another way to look at this in our world is, if you have a positive screening test, how many amniocentesis um, would you have to do to identify uh, that one? And to that end, our uh, reports were designed entirely with the patient and physician in mind. And as you can see, uh, here's an example of a 22Q report in addition to the um, standard panorama test. Um, and what you can see there is if you are in fact positive, you'll see that the panorama risk score is 1 in 19. So we actually give the prior risk score, which you heard is 1 in 2000. Now there's a new risk score, 1 in 19, and we also provide the interpretation, which is, of course, follow-up counseling um, and the option of testing is recommended. We also give the negative predictive value as well. And again, really my last few slides here, you already heard it before, but 22Q, early intervention matters. And that's really the purpose of the webinar today, to alert, to educate, and to make a difference in our patients' lives. If you know ahead of time, you can prepare to deliver the baby at a proper facility. No live vaccines. The knowledge and the importance of the interplay between calcium and seizure activity. Checking the palate um, to address malnutrition and speech development problems. And most importantly, to help families avoid the diagnos diagnostic odyssey. As you um, understood from Donna's slides quite well, and if you speak to parents, it often is at least months uh, where, again, they are going from pillar to post to try to help their children. This is the article that Donna referred to um, from Ann Bassett's group in Toronto. Um, I have highlighted the, um, the primary uh, passages from the abstract, again, publicly available, of course. But the bottom line is that neonatal seizures may increase the risk for more severe intellectual deficits in 22Q11.2 uh, deletion syndrome and likely mediated by neonatal hypocalcemia. And this group makes the point that there is potential here for newborn um, for newborn, or as they say, neonatal screening. As you can see, prenatal risk assessment could be incredibly valuable because even if a newborn screening test is done, it still takes time to get the result back, at which point the child may be compromised from uh, hypocalcemia and even possibly infection. Uh, we are very proud to have partnered and affiliate with, uh, 22, uh, with the 22Q Foundation. Uh, I can't stress enough, uh, having been in practice for decades, uh, working collaboratively with support groups and being very sensitive to their needs and concerns is really not the best way, but I would say the only way to really have a positive impact. And again, the possibility of arranging for comprehensive care early in life to provide supports for parents and families, again, I can't overstate that. And I'm just going to wrap up with the final slide. There will be some more um, uh, discussion, uh, I hope, on the webinar and uh, questions from the audience. I just, again, want to thank everybody involved, including the technical staff. Um, and most of all, Donna, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Gross. It was a pleasure to have both of you be able to go through that with us today. I think we're especially lucky to be able to hear from Donna regarding the 22Q11.2 deletion, and I know that we all learned a lot today. There are a handful of questions, so we'll go through. If you have a question, feel free to type it into the Q&A, and we will get to it if we have time. We do have a couple of minutes. It's just about the end of time. The main question revolves around the positive predictive value of the screening panorama test for microdeletion. So Stu, if you will answer this question, it's what's the approximate PPV of the test and how are the risk scores reported? So again, I'm sorry, I went through the uh, report that I posted there. Um, if you have a positive um, risk score, it is actually, it, it reads as a positive risk score. I'm trying to actually uh, push to the audience so that it should be coming up on the screen now. 
Um, we provide the prior risk score and uh, 422Q, although we provide this for all the microdeletions, we have the PPV. It's stated clearly and it is um, there to make understanding, uh, to make this more understandable to the patient and the provider. And, you know, really what we're saying here is we have to do approximately, you know, we have one in 19, but approximately 20 amnios to identify a case of 22Q. That number was picked very carefully because that actually is the risk with serum screening. Um, we did not want to make it more, um, we did not want to have a lower PPV than we are currently using for standard testing. Um, but it is a way that doctors and patients will understand, uh, hopefully, the report and the test. Most important, uh, we do have people like Melissa and a very strong genetic counseling team who are available to help with the reports in any way, any circumstance, we're there. Thank you. So just to reiterate, the risk score range would be for a positive screening test, anywhere from 1 in 6 to 1 in 26, depending on the disorder. And as you see here for 22Q, it's 1 in 19. And thank you for that description of positive predictive value. The other question, which will be our last question for today, just for the sake of time, but we will certainly respond via email to the others, is are there concerns with increasing the false positive rate? So maybe, Sue, you can speak to the false positive rate when we include microdeletion. Um, I would be delighted. So this actually is related to the first excellent question. Um, you can, as we know with screening tests, you can set your cutoffs anywhere you want. Um, our understanding from the medical community and as well as patients is that they're going for non-invasive because they do not want an increased uh, risk of, in, or don't want to undergo invasive, t invasive testing without more information. And we kept the false positive rate, I am pleased to say, even with the full microdeletion panel, um, right now it's set at about 1.2%. Panorama itself, um, without the microdeletions, is, um, you know, 0.1%. Um, with, with the addition of the microdeletions, we held it to around 1% uh, or so. Half of those are related to uh, 22Q approximately. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our webinar today. Thank you so much to our presenters for sharing that information with us and for all of you on the phone joining us. This will be available to you to access. We will make sure to send you that information and we will also make sure to answer questions we were unable to get to. Thank you everyone for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful day.